Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for that very warm welcome. We, we have got so much for you this evening. We've got, uh, we've got notebooks, we've got, we've got films, we've got a, a full house, uh, and above all, we have, we have Julie Brooke. My name's Robert McFarlane. Uh, I first heard of Julie in 2012, and I was told about an artist, a land artist, perhaps, who was very drawn to remote places, to wild landscapes, which were things that interested me as well. I knew she'd worked on, on Hoi. I knew she'd worked on Mingale. And it is typical of Julie that I have just this moment, standing waiting to come on stage, discovered that on Mingale, among the people she met was the Queen <laughs> <laughs> on her own. Uh, and she told the Queen strange stories of shepherds and then went down and met the whole royal family. Didn't ask if Andrew was there, but anyway. And um, uh, uh, so, yeah, the, 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 this is this is classic Brooke, if I can if I can put it like that. Um, most amazingly, I learned that she had lived lived for three years, two periods of six months, and a full year under a natural rock arch on the west coast of Jura. And I knew also that she worked in desert landscapes. And I went away from this first encounter with the idea of Julie, and I googled her, and I was intrigued, and I googled her some more and I was amazed and um, <laughs> that really was the beginning of a, of a path uh, that has led me to friendship first with one of the most amazing people I know and, and now to this evening. Um, are you hearing me okay at the back? Great. So she works with, with rock and light and shadow and gravity and tide as her materials. Uh, her medium, if it, she can be said to have one, is landscape, but also water. Perhaps we include that within that category of landscape. And she carries some of these works away beyond the places of their making by means of, of film uh, uh, moving and photography still. And I found something very different to Robert Smithson or, or Richard Long, their land art, with occasional tendencies to, to the monumental. I found something that was, that was resonant, that was beautiful, that was subtle, and that was very, very brave. This was someone who put themselves in the way of the wild world. This was someone who used their body as a sensing technology and as a means of making. Someone who was committed to craft in a very um, artisanal sense and to, to labor too in ways that were amazing to this um, soft-fingered, desk-bound writer. Um, <laughs> uh, and I was reminded very often and have been often since of the, of the prose of Nan Shepherd, who um, walked into the mountain and, and Julie works into landscapes. So I met her not long after that. I'm, I'm lucky still to be her friend. I hope that's still the case after tonight. She has the slightly strange experience of sitting <laughs> silently now uh, and being talked about, but you are going to hear from her after, after we've seen films. I'm going to describe her as a, as a fire stack. I think she's a fire stack on who, whom the tide never really comes in. She, she blazes with ideas, with joy, with wonder. She lights up uh, the world around her in her personality and in her work. Um, we've corresponded since then. I was reading back through our correspondence. It's one of the three or four I have that um, uh, that, that adds up, for me at least, to a, a document of real um, substance and, and, and time. Tens of thousands of words. These, these letters will come in with images from uh, returning from Namibia, returning from Japan, returning from the underworld, returning from the desert, returning from um, Ardberg, where some of the works that you're going to see tonight are made, carrying extraordinary gusts of image and language and they're they're wonderful they're like ravens landing in your inbox um, carrying <laughs> the wild in their beak so she makes what look like simple interventions in strong languages that possess a vast echoing power in the landscape and the mind and here we are to see some of those tonight um, there's an exhibition upstairs which i'll mention at the end which you're all very welcome tonight it brings me huge pleasure to be here. What we're going to do, the map of the evening, is Julie and I are now going to um, sit down, actually in seats that have slightly disappeared. <laughs> I will go um, at the back. Robert. But we can go at the back, it doesn't yeah. matter. Um, 
That's fine. No, it's fine. No, don't worry. No. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> don't feel at no, all awkward don't about worry. that. Please don't worry. They were very small signs, to be fair. <laughs> sorry. sorry. Oh, no. You aren't leaving the entire room, are you? No, no, that's fine. Okay, okay. Actually, you know, we could go and sit in the back, Rob, and they could just no, carry on. Fine. I think they're there now. So, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, okay. We're definitely going to sit there. So we're going to. There's going to be a, a, a brief one-minute documentary clip about the time on Jura. Then we're going to watch the, a full firing, the spring fire stack firing from 2019, which is about 14 minutes in, in running time. First viewing. First viewing. But not premiere, because it would then compromise festivals. But uh, okay. it is the, it's a preview. It's the first public viewing of this. But not a premiere. <laughs> okay? No tweeting premiere. Hashtag. Um, preview is fine. Preview is fine. <laughs> then we're going to jump back up. We'll talk for 25 minutes, half an hour or so. We might get some readings from Judy's notebooks. I've been promised a funny story about a fishing trawler. And is that right? Yeah. Great. Okay, no pressure. It's a good one. Um, <laughs> uh, and then we'll have a shorter summer firing, which will, as it were, bookend um, the, 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 our discussion of about 10 minutes from 2017. Then we'll open to you. We'll, we'll run for between an hour and 20 minutes, an hour and 30 minutes in total. And then those who wish can, can join Julie up in the gallery, uh, one floor up afterwards. So thank you all for being here. A huge welcome to Julie Brook. Thank you. And to Robert McFarlane. I was living on the west side of Jura in, in, in solitude um, in a natural cliff arch and I was dealing with the elements every day and I had the idea then of bringing the four elements together because I collected water every day, I was building a fire to cook on every day. So it, it was absolutely intrinsically part of the way I was living.
exhausting. <laughs> that was amazing. And I'm yeah, a bit this, hot. <laughs> the series Nature Unwrapped, that this is part, it makes me, it makes nature sound a bit like a sausage roll. Um, <laughs> but that was incredible. My body, I don't know if you feel it, my, my body is tired from the, the movement it called out. It was visceral in that overused word. Um, uh, I want to start with why, um, uh, which is also a sort of how question. But yes. why did you make? Why have, why have you made these things? Um, well, I started making them in the second year that I was in the Arch in Jura, and a very simple answer to that is that the way I lived in the Arch, I was collecting water every day, I was swimming every day in the sea, um, which I know you do as well. Um, I was building fires every day to cook on, and. I had been building in the arch to make it a bit more habitable. For those of you who saw um, a little bit of clip, that the wooden baffle and, and then the cloth pouch later on. And I was painting on the hill at the time. I had three different campsites and I was working on big canvases. But I, that was a fairly agonizing process and I loved the building and I wondered why I couldn't use that passion and ease and um, immense practicality to put into the work, um, there seemed to be a bit of a separation. And so then I thought I had also created a garden because I got a bit tired of not eating green things. <laughs> <laughs> I was sort of living off, you know, potatoes and onions, and potatoes and onions and things. Because um, I, wasn't, I wasn't trying to survive with food. I had bought food in by boat. Um, and after building the wall of the, the garden just to, to wall some earth, I thought, why, why aren't I using these skills just to, to make work? And so I then very tentatively started experimenting on the beach. And I thought, wouldn't it be amazing to bring all the elements together in one work? Because that's what I'm living every single day. And the first few attempts were really tentative. They were too far on the edge of the water, um, of, you know, too far um, away from the sea in the sense, too near the edge of the water. And then I really watched the, the seabed where I was staying um, in Jura and worked out what I felt would be a good place um, in the sort of center of the bay. And I, I, by, by the time I got over the sort of that moment of inhibition of going, shall I, shan't I, which is something I'm very passionate to communicate to students, always just do it, a bit like a cold swim. Don't think too much, just do it. And that was my real maxim, actually, in the arch, because it sort of really gave, kept my courage very, very lucid. Which year, which year are we in now? So we're in 92. I, I began living in Jura in 91. Yeah. Um, and it was after I'd been building the cloth house in 92 when I got a bit fed up with living in a tent inside the arch to sleep in. And um, so I then built the first one and I had lots of falls um, and at, you know as you know I was on my own and I was learning to, for the first time to, to use dry stone walling. In the, in the it, sea? I in mean, the you sea. Were, you were standing on dry ground when you began making it yes, before I would the tide be, would come back yes, in but like, then also... Yes and then it would slowly come up. Um, so um, I had to sort of learn um, to navigate around the tide. I would work out, I didn't have any tide tables even, everything was you know, what we talked about earlier, that just learn knowledge, observe knowledge. I, I was watching the tides and then working out, okay, I've got this number of hours Did you have a build. watch no. when you were there? No watch? <laughs> no, no time I just watched the, you watched the light yeah. and the... Um, and so I knew I had a certain number of hours, so if I got, as soon as it, that site was clear, I'd start building and then looking for stones. And once the tide was back in, I would then go and look for stones to bring to that area because looking for stones can take ages. <laughs> Some of my team who might be here will vouch say for that. Um, so, and then I would, the tide would recede and I would build the next few layers. And, but it was really trial and error. But I knew once I would got into it, I knew I was onto something so true to what I felt about living there. It, it, it's such a passionate expression of, of how much I loved living there. W w w was fire involved at this point? Um, yeah, I'd always knew I wanted to. So th the very simple idea was simply to isolate fire in the middle of water mm. um, and that wonderful contradiction. Mm. And that was 
the beginning of that was as simple as that. But what's so, so exciting when you make work out in the landscape is you, you don't really know, you know, you start with quite a simple idea. Do you know quite a lot of my ideas are really simple? But in fact, they start layering themselves in this amazing way as you do them. And which is why I think just do it is such a good thing because then you, it begins to speak back to you and it tell, begins to tell you more about what it's about. And did you, uh, because you left Jura in 94? Four, yeah. And did you return to this idea or did it lie dormant in your imagination while you were off in deserts or on other islands? Or Well, what, um, I returned to it in 2015. And not, not before, there was, a, there was then there was 10, that, yeah. uh, 20 years, yeah. really, of, yeah. uh, right. And yeah. perhaps you could locate uh, people who don't know where the Aardberg is and where mm. this, but just place us in the landscape, in the, in the world. So um, this, this came about, actually, um, when the BBC4 um, asked me if I would make another one, J James Fox, would I make another fire stack? And then initially I was a bit thinking how strange to go back. Um, but I um, went to Ardvec, which amazingly Robert has written about in the old ways, um, very just in a sense coincidentally. Um, and um, I found a beach that I could work on that had all the ingredients, as it were. And um, so I then thought, okay, well, wh why not? Let's. It would be amazing to redo, you know, do that because I wasn't trying to do it in the same place. And um, it was really challenging to get back into it. Um, but then after uh, the first series of firings, in fact, the BBC didn't turn up. Um, <laughs> but luckily, they came the second time. And, and we had a really exciting firing. But I then understood. I had then been in that 20-year period. I'd been filming much, much more. So I was now using sound. Yeah. I was using... I, I just had a more, in a sense, a more rounded knowledge of understanding how to use film. In Jura, I just had a Super 8 camera. <laughs> and I was learning. I just thought, I need a moving it, you know, camera. And I persuaded Chris, my partner, to get me a, a you know, Super 8 silent camera. He knows a bit about cameras. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we're, um, we're on the, the west coast or the southwest coast of, of Lewis. Um, yes, I always say North Harris. North Harris, yeah, there's a de <laughs> debated border. Um, so. Um, uh, on the outer, the outer Hebrides, the Western Isles, and this is, um, and I should say, this is a place that is, uh, there's no roadhead to it. <laughs> no. This is a place that's very, very hard to get to. You get there most easily by by sea. Yes. Um, and pretty arduously on on foot or on horseback. Um, uh, <laughs> you can't get there. I mean, you, there's probably an estate track that could get you. Yes. Vaguely you, close. But, yes. Um, um, but but, but you, you have to walk over moorland. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, and and uh, and and what way? Just so we can orient ourselves, what way mm. are we facing in that that final shot where we we were looking with the sun setting? Are we looking due west. Due west. Yeah. Due west, right across the Atlantic. Yeah. Um, Next stop, St Kilda, and, and stop after that, America. America. Yeah. 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 Uh, just if you're passing by. <laughs> <laughs> um, exactly. And and tell us now a bit a bit about. I talked about craft and labour. Mm. I mean, one of the things that's always amazed me is is just how hard your work is to make, um, and and how much it tests your your body. I'm thinking of that work. I'm thinking of the the work most recently in Japan, which we might we, we might talk about a bit later. Mm. I know you have help, <laughs> yeah. and some of those those well, stokers, now, now and build, but, do, you, but yeah. not always. So, do, can you just describe to us what goes into making a stack and firing a stack? Um, well, you're, you're first of all uh, collecting stones that are suitable to build with just from, from around a beach. So you do need a very particular beach, just in case you'd like to try one. Um, and the bigger the stones at the beginning, the better, because as you can see, it gets a lot of stick from the sea. <laughs> um, and um, then, so you're, you're collecting that from... Them and, and you, you begin to learn what's a really good building stone and what's going to hold. And, and then that creates the next layer and then the next layer. And that will take about three to four days to establish a stack. And on this, um, then when I'm firing now, um, where there's a rhythm 
of about, I have a window of about five days where I'm working with an incrementally rising high tide and then it's just beginning to fall away and then it falls away too much. So you, you don't have the sort of um, tension between mm. the fire and the water. Mm. And so we're filming and building. In this case, we were rebuilding every single day. And more, what's more, we were also removing probably about 10 tons of seaweed <laughs> before we started building again. So that got a bit irksome at times. <laughs> um, but um, in the way that I guess when I was doing it on my own, I, I, once I'm engaged in work, I'm, I'm so focused and connected. And um, I hope I really bring the team along with me. Um, so far, it's, it's working fine. Well, we might hear um, from them at the end. Yeah, the exactly. They yeah. might stand up and <laughs> say a few words. Um, but it's such an exciting thing to bring a team together and bring them on side. And we're all learning as we go along, and they're learning new skills of building. Um, one of my chief stokers I know is here, and he also learned to build with stone. Um, he's, in fact, going to start carving with stone quite soon. And um, so you're, you're helping teach the team and, and to, to create this very cohesive force. And even though it's very demanding, you, you know, you're walking over to the site, you're also building up this amazing fitness. And we, we do get tired, um, but because you're so galvanized by the, the tide and the sort of drama, um, the drama and the yeah. desire to, to make it happen, yeah. it keeps us going until you know, the tide has sort of started receding again. Can I ask about the fire and mm. keeping going? Um, is it, it's so uh, radiant as a, as a presence and so, uh, I mean, the, just the drama of will it, won't it, when, when will it, <laughs> yeah. it must. Um, uh, and, and as you say, that, 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 that play, um, it's not that the fire loses to the sea because the sea isn't, isn't the enemy, it's not the no, enemy. No, um, it's more that sort of tension, isn't yeah. it, between the two. And sometimes the fire just keeps coming back. Yeah, right. Yeah. How, but how, um, can I ask about accelerants and, and, um, <laughs> uh, and, and, and such uh, sort of arsonist things? Um, yeah. There must be something which keeps the fire burning above and beyond. Well, initially I was using driftwood, which is really difficult to dry in huh. that environment, um, and also drift plastic, because uh, it burns as oil. And, and then, um, because I've sort of used up all the driftwood, I now laboriously, um, where I live in the sky, we, we're surrounded by trees and have windfalls. Um, so I chop up all those and take them out by boat. Huh. Um, to Ardvec. So then I can actually season wood. So I actually have a much better system of working with seasoned wood that I chop. Well, actually, not me, but the stokers chop. Um, <laughs> chop into quite small pieces. So we build up the big heat is built from wood, but we'll use drift rope to maybe, if, if the fire's a little bit slack or, or there's been a big wave, we'll put a rope on in between to, to really... Um, you know, sort of in a sense, give a big whoosh to the wood, but it's the wood that's holding the, the flame. And does it go all the way down inside the stack? How it wears? No, how so it, the it's coming up to about sort of. Um, it varies, but sometimes they're about there and a little bit, you know. And then there's a. It's like a, a two meter in diameter cylindrical form with a bowl um, in the in the in at the top, which is quite a lot deeper than the, than the top of the fire stack. And the stokers, we put some stones around the um, edge of at the bottom so that they can stand to, to, to put the, the wood on top. And um, you can see this firing was really um, challenging. And I know Lewis, who's here tonight, um, also experienced that in the winter, where they're, they're really dashing in with big baskets of wood and loading in between, you know, the lull, in the sense, the lulls that you occasionally get between the very big waves and the less big waves. I, I, I never want to ask an artist, what does your work mean? And it's clear that um, true work, like as, as this is, refuses to, to be singularized or to, or to, or to, to collapse in on itself, um, to leave a single stone standing. But um, I, I mean, I think about Hope. I think about hope in the dark. I think um, I think a little bit about 
where we, it feels as though we are now um, globally, culturally. It's not been a great start to 2020. I think we could all agree um, impeachments, uh, pandemics, uh, and, um, and bushfires. Um, and this, there seems to be something here uh, to me about both warning and about hope, about persistence. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a scene in um, Agamemnon um, where the, the, there's one man whose job it is to watch for the news that, that Troy has fallen. Uh, and he lives for years on the top of a palace roof. And his one job is to watch for the fire being lit on the horizon. And then when the fire is finally lit after all these years, um, Ischglis writes, he could not speak because an ox was on his tongue. Most amazing image. And mm. so when, the, when mm. the message finally comes, the, the, war, the, the messenger cannot speak of the moment of warning or, or revelation. So when I see your work, all of these things are going through my mind. And I, I, wonder, I wonder how you hear it and see it, if you can say a little to us about, about what the work sort of blazes into being for you. And it might be none of the things I've just talked about. Well, I think one of the reasons why I've um, really extended my uh, sense of work into it, um, having, having done the BBC documentary, was that because I was working, A, in a more, I was exploring the sound on a much, on a much mm. different level, and I realised how sound is so important to me. Um, but also I realised from Dura it was enough for me to say, this is so exciting to bring the four elements together. But when I started reworking them, what I realized is they were about so much more. And they have this really beautiful choreography about them, um, almost like a sort of choreography of time, where time, we talked about it a little bit, Robert, about the notion of time being physically manifest and also the tide being physically manifest. It's very difficult for us to really look at the tide coming in all the time, we'd sort of wander off or daydream. Mm. But when you have a focal point, mm. which is really what, you know, what I think of the fast like actually is a sort of like a visual catalyst for all the invisible forces at play. Mm. And one is the, the whole notion of this incredible, the fact that the tide is coming in twice in every 24 hours, high tide, and going out again. And that that's all connected with the pull of the moon mm. and gravity and, you know, gravity being why we actually are sitting down right now and why you are as well. And these really basic laws of physics that we, because like breathing, they are so fundamental to our existence, we don't think about them. And in fact, they're really precious and they're amazing. And I read somewhere recently, Rumi said, sell cleverness by wonder. And I thought, yeah, that's good. That's really good. Um, because it, it's that wonder of our natural world. It's, it's an amazing thing. And when I'm making these, I feel they're tapping into these very fundamental elements that are around us, a apart from the very obvious of this whole amazing tension between the fire and water and, and their sort of vying of one another and the stone. Um, and... I think that that's why I've, I've now been working on these through the seasons for the last five years. Um, and they are hard work, but you know, when, you, when you feel that, you, you feel very driven and, and able to, to really give your energy to it and, and bring your team with you as well. That, that Rumi line uh, reminded me of something one, uh, that Charles Simich, the poet, uh, once said, um, for knowledge add, for wisdom take away. And um, I, I've st I've, I'm still working that one through after all these years, but but I, I think much is taken away from this. You don't give us much. There's no voiceover. There's no text apart from the brief captions at be beginning and end. It's this is a, a, a stripped back site, and 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 yet it, uh, it, it 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 brims over with um, with with force and with with implication. I think as a result of that, I think these are very wise works in that sense. Um, well, I sort of want you to feel you're in some way there. I, and sound, actually, uh, because I, I know we were, we were in a basement in 
<laughs> North London. <laughs> but it was a, it was an incredibly embodying experience. And, and how do you, where are your microphones? Wow, that's <laughs> exciting. Um, I have t I worked with two really wonderful sound people, um, Angel and Sean. Alas, neither of them are here tonight. But um, so some of them are. Um, being held right by the fast act when the stokers go in, the sound person can go in. Um, so in this case, Sean um, was right in there with the stokers. And there was a couple of times when the stokers got knocked off their feet mm. and Sean was still recording with his mic totally up to here in water. And um, Angel the same, he like prefers to wear a wetsuit. So he has been known to be paddling around with his mics up here. And, but also, um, Angel particularly has explored the whole um, underwater world of the sound. So there was a lot of underwater sound you experienced mm. in, in that one. And, and when we show you the summer one, it, almost even more. Um, I'm just yeah. going to check how yeah. we're doing. I think, um, I, wondered, uh, I think we've got a few more minutes before we, we watch the... You want me to read a little bit? Yeah, I'd love you to read. OK. Um, so what I... It's really pragmatic. It's not... It's not profound what I'm going to read. It's just really direct um, to give you a sense. I was in anticipation of speaking with Robert. I, I was just doing a bit of rootling around in my Jura books. And um, I wanted just to read a little bit, just two very practical extracts from um, August of 92 and then August of 93, if that's all right. Um, August 92. I worked hard all evening in the re relentless rain, building up the walls of the fire stack. So this is very early on in, in my discovery of them. Gradually, I'm getting better at fitting the irregular shapes of the stones. The stack is a point in the bay. It marks the tide. I know better how the waters come according to the slight undulations in the seabed. Suddenly, the middle part of the bay fills quickly. I was up to my boots in water, reloading the fire with a good amount of hard, thick logs. Then I waited. Soon I could take the raft. I don't use a raft anymore. Um, um, it was past midnight and dark. The flames cast reflections of orange onto the sea. The sea rose. I paddled out slowly to the light of the fire with another load. The cold of the water in my boots, the heat of the fire shining on my face, the waves rocked the raft in the wood, the light was dazzling to my dark, accustomed eyes. The sea began to run in waves through the bottom of the bowl. Still the fire continued to burn and crack. The water hissed in the ho on the hot stones, and from the shore, a ring of stone afloat on the waters, with flames blazing, their brightness casting light across the cool arc of the pebble bay. I felt alone in the large darkness of the sky and sea. And then there's... There's another extract, um, which is from the following year, when I was, because I was still pursuing them. Um, August the 17th, 1993. Thursday, woke up at 3 a.m., low cloud and drizzle. It was raining when I went out, but it was a little clearer. And as I awoke, as I awoke it seemed very quiet, then suddenly a huge crash. The waves were enormous in bouts out of an entirely calm sea. My heart sunk quietly, but I leapt out of bed and walked to the stack with the rain coming down. This was after uh, several builds and falls with no firing, so there's a bit of a context here. <laughs> I managed to get a fire going, and soon the drizzle cleared a bit. The sea was alarming. Although it gets terribly rough here, on the whole, the breakers are never that big. I was awash with tiredness, but still very alert and energetic, and a calming combination. I watched from the shore. It was still too dark to film. The sea came near in fits and bursts, owing to the force of some of the waves. You become very aware of each sound, owing to the contrast of quiet and then such loud crashes. Soon the waves were breaking onto the walls. How many tons of water in each wave? What force, what weight breaks against the stones? The stack burned furiously and bravely. It seemed so dark everywhere, and then the very bright flame, darkest hour before dawn. Dawn seemed to take an age to come, the tide getting higher and the stack's ch chances of survival diminishing with the re relentless waves. Dawn was barely visible. Crash in one fell swoop. 
The fire was flung in all directions and the light of the flame vanished. Smoke rose in a thick fume as the stones hissed and cracked with the cold water. I was both frozen to the ground watching, a strange mix of feeling inside me, a sense of huge relief, not least that I didn't have to load up the raft and go out on those waves, and total incredulity. The sea had not been too high around the walls. As the fire was flung in all directions, the wall fell with a rumble and crash. Three days to build, one second to demolish. I nodded acceptingly at the sea. For all our myriad of emotions, there is nothing we can do relative to the sea. One large piece of wood sailed away, holding the glow of its embers. The wall was barely visible. <laughs> Um, turns out Julie's a jaw-droppingly good writer as no, well. As no, that's really really good. annoying. Um, uh, look, we're gonna we're gonna watch a second firing. This is. Um, but do you want me to give you the fishing boat story before? No, let's have the fishing boat story after. Okay. Because, um, but I can I just yeah. read those lines from Hopkins? That yeah, that Because they be, follow on. Yeah. So um, we were talking um, most recently uh, a month or so ago. Yeah, after the autumn. Uh, to the autumn fire stack, and uh, I'd just been teaching a, a poem I love and have read, read and taught many times, which is by a sonnet by Gerard Manny Hopkins called that, that nature is a Heraclitian fire uh, and of the comfort of the resurrection. And he wrote it in 1888, uh, a few days after a storm, in fact. And there is, uh, there's, it, uh, and I said to, to Judy, you must uh, know this sonnet. It's sort of, it, it is the fire stacks, really. And, if, and, and that, so I read it to her. And I'll just read you some lines from the middle of it, because they are really uh, echoed in your own journal. Hopkins is a great journal keeper himself. So, million fueled, nature's bonfire burns on, but quench her bonniest, dearest to her, her clearest selvage spark. Man, how fast his fire dint, his mark on mind is gone. Both are in an unfathomable, all is in an enormous dark drowned. And it seemed to be exactly what you were mm. writing about in mm. that amazing mm. diary entry. Okay, well, we'll uh, so we've got, it's about 11 minutes. This is a, a summer firing mm -hmm. 2017. Yes. And the light at that latitude is, is prob I mean, there's not m much dark left. Probably between 11 and 1, you get you get dark. R mm. True dark. I'll up past 11 to about 1 in the morning. Okay. And then we'll, we'll come back up and we'll open to, to questions from, from the floor. Thank you.
million fuel at nature's bonfire burns on. That amazing moments at the end, the breathing, mm. breathing. And it's so, um, it's, that's all just happening in real time. And even over a more extended period, even than I'm showing you. That was a beautiful contrast to the storm of the, the fury of the of the first firing. Um, I'm going to open to uh, the floor, um, but I really want the story. Do we? We want the story, don't we? Yeah. You want the story? Right. Okay. <laughs> this had better be funny. <laughs> oh God! Yeah. Well, actually. Um, okay. In fact, I'm going to. If I just say it, I'll ramble on too much, so I'm going to read it. Uh, so July the 1st, 1993. At high tide, I went out to investigate. No sign of any of the stones. An on ominous sign. I took out the raft to have a better look. The sea was deep over the stones, and a lot had fallen, alas. Although the sea appears calmer, there is still quite a swell to it. As I was watching the stack, the fishing boat that's been yelling hellos came by and drove into the bay. Two young and good-looking fellows, Hans and Douglas. How long have you been here? How's your sanity? <laughs> Thumbs up from me as I inwardly chuckled, probably to the outsider somewhat dubious when you think of my struggles on the, uh, on the raft. Luckily, today, I had my pants on. <laughs> then, then there's another one. Okay, uh, let me find it here. Uh, so this is now a little bit later on, same fishing boat. Uh, September. Oops, sorry. I think that might be my is it phone. My mic so or, or yours? No, that's yeah. That's my uh, phone. Sorry, of all the people. <laughs> yeah, it's gone. Um, uh, Wednesday, September the eighth, nineteen ninety-three. The more I work with the stack, the more it opens up different ideas, small realizations, different views, subtle in change, but each change significant. I burnt rope too to create a good flame and continue working until about 5.30. I was completely naked and taking photographs when the fishing boat went past. So I hid behind the stack, bar my head and arms and waved as ever. <laughs> they waved back. <laughs> what they must think of me. <laughs> Forever in the seabed, and now just my head and arms visible behind the wall, that round wall. I chuckled away to myself. <laughs> that so, was uh, that wonderfully was, worth it. Um, um, is it me that's banging? No, sorry, sorry I think it's me, isn't it's it? Judy, sorry, yeah, okay. sorry, myself. Um, it reminds me of Nan Shepherd's wonderful descriptions of skinny dipping in Loch Arne, deep in the Cairngorms, and of Roger Deakin swimming um, naked down the river test in, in waterlogged, much to the chagrin of the bailiffs of that uh, celebrated trout water. Um, <laughs> so, many questions, I'm sure. Um, so we've got two roving mics, and uh, I'll start here, and then um, I'll go to the back, and then come over there. Uh, thank you so much. I didn't realize how moving it would be. You know, in the first video of the film, sorry, uh, when things fell away, I just felt like, oh, I just had a rush of family members who've died and things move on and then you pulled back to the light. It was just so moving and beautiful. So I just wanted to say that. But the Thank question you. is, um, when I think of sense of place, I think of it as the sort of indivisible layer of memories and history and emotions that are sort of over a physical landscape, like invisible strata. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, did, you take a, did it take a while to accumulate a sense of place to make these installations? Or did you so-called impose it there? Or did you let this art sort of come out of it organically and it, and it came to you to place this there? I'm sort of wondering about that, the origin. Um, so it's a really good question. Um, it, all the work I do, I have to wait, and it has to come to me. Sometimes, um, in a different way, like in Namibia, I'm travelling along and responding to the landscape as I'm moving. So it's a different form of relationship and response. But in the arch, um, this informs partly why I wanted to talk about it with Robert. Is that it? it this particular mode of working really informs my whole practice by really living and breathing the landscape and immersing myself in it. Then I know 
what I'm doing is not a, an idea that I'm posing on, but it's, a, it's about a balance of you have ideas swirling around, but actually you're drawing them out. And something I learned really strongly in Jura is that often the best ideas or the best things we have in us as artists or, and makers is that they're actually very, very close to us and it's just about revealing them. But it can take um, a certain moment, a certain period of time and immersion and engagement to experience that reveal. And then you're following a very natural course of unfolding. And that's when the work is really exciting because it feels very balanced and very, very much in relation to um, all the different things you're trying to do within that particular landscape. And, and you, uh, you live on Skye and have lived there for 20 years, 20 years now. And, and you, your Gaelic is coming on still? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I've yeah, heard no. Julie speak Gaelic. Yeah. Uh, to our, we have dear Gaelic-speaking friends in common. And um, yeah. I remember being very, very admiring of that. Um, there's a question at the, at the back. Thank you. Um, and then next over here. And then next over there. Oh, thank you. And I'm sorry, I apologise in advance because I don't know the details of your early biography or training, but I was fascinated by what you said at the very beginning about you were initially there working with large canvases yes. and there was some strain or tension or difficulty, which I, I know well from my own work, um, and then you began to do the fire stacks. I wonder if once you had worked on the fire stacks, did that then change how you felt about your other practice or your previous training? Have you returned to that? Or di did some things end for you completely once you discovered this kind of building work? Um, in Jura, the painting and the um, uh, sculptural work went absolutely hand in hand. And they were very, very complementary. So after I'd done a period of building and firing, it was a real relief to stop. <laughs> and then go back onto the hill and really re-engage with sort of um, excitement and tussle and challenge of, of these big, big canvases. And so then I developed, because I was living on my own, you know, I could develop a really consistent rhythm there. Um, and that's so exciting. You know when you're writing, you, you go not literally underground, but you don't really surface for a bit, you know. And it, it creates a thread where you feel you're going below the surface. Um, and then that practice continued when I went on to Mingale. Um, and then in more recent years, I still paint and draw. I wanted to say I'm really passionate about drawing. And I feel a lot of my work is actually just about drawing the landscape in some way. Um, and I still paint, but not, um, not at the moment on big canvases. But I'm thinking about it again. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, it's another process question. Sorry about that. But I think your work, um, certainly that we've seen tonight, seems to kind of engage you, the, 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 the viewer, in, in the process. Um, you mentioned about your um, technical abilities with film and sound developing um, over time. Um, and just watching the, 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 the films, it, it, it made certainly me think about the, the sort of phases of the work, you know, the, the creation phase and then the the event phase, as it were, and then the recording, and then you know the viewing that's going on now. Mm. And I wondered whether um, that development of your, your technical abilities with film and sound um, uh, altered the, the, the focus of your aspiration for the work, or whether indeed it's, it, it's separate for, for you at all in, 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 in that way. Um, I think it's, it feels all very interconnected. I mean, I rely much more you know, I don't record the sound. I, the sound is a very sophisticated thing, and it's really exciting working with very good and very adventurous sound artists. Um, and then also working with a, um, the most fantastic editor, because um, a lot of the discovery of the work is in the editing, and, you know, coming home to rushes. And when I'm out there filming and making, I'm, I'm just in, in the thick of everything. And, um, and then there's this sort of reflection period of then going into the more technical side. But it feels 
there's a sort of wonderful continuity and the, the different team members and um, experts, as it were, help carry and ha really help me discover it. My um, current editor is here, Adelina, yeah. here, who's, who's wonderful because she listens and is very patient and really wants to understand and dig deep into what I'm trying to express. So the, t the technical challenge of bringing these films into being are not unlike, you know, I, I feel my camera's like a spade. I, I dig with my camera. And so I don't really still regard myself much as a photographer, even though I do take the photographs in film. But in fact, also, I rely hugely on my eldest daughter, who's also here, um, as my um, other camera. And in fact, she recorded that million dollar shot of the fall while I was actually being knocked over by that wave. <laughs> so, uh, thanks, Willie. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's an, it's an interesting, but it all feels very, very interconnected. Thank you. I just wanted to ask you about the, the initial film. It felt like much more of a solo project. You were there on your own, you were creating the fire sack, so it's a one shot with a Super 8. Would you call it much more collaborative now, given that it's got editing, it's got a very different feel? Essentially, it's the same fire stack, but mm. it's being interpreted by other people through the editing, through the sound. Could it be described? It, it, it just feels more collaborative in that respect and the way that you're talking about it. Yes, I, I think if you saw the whole of the um, early fire stack film, um, it's still... Um, it, I mean, it's a, a much simpler film, but it's still got something of that sort of energy of the fast act, but absolutely, um, I now need help. I really love help. A lot of my help is coming from um, young postgraduates, so, and some of whom had, had never been in very wild places like this. And so there's a, a fantastic synergy going on. And I, I adore teaching anyway. Um, a lot of my teaching practice has been with very young children, actually. But this is, I feel, the most profound way in which I can give to young people and, and welcome them into these really extraordinary landscapes that I work in. But also those processes, in, even if it doesn't particularly relate to their own work, but I feel they can draw from that collective spirit of really working together. Um, and it's, it's really very magical. And... Recently, one of the stokers, Rory, um, who was there for, for this, the very, the very fierce fast act, um, he said, isn't it amazing? While we're doing it, you, you know, we're in the dark, we're in the middle of nowhere, and it's just this team of maybe five or six of us, and we're all coordinating together. And things like um, coordinating the stokers, that, that's a really critical thing. Um, it feels like this sort of choreography happening. And that's, in fact, that has actually started making me work with a choreographer, actually, in a different way in Japan. I think it's also here, Rosa. Um, because I was so fascinated by the, this relationship we all bore. And, in fact, now I um, have a wonderful documentary filmmaker who's um, observing the firings. And she came in the autumn and... Um, because I felt it would be wonderful for people to experience that sort of... Um, it almost, at our best, we become almost unspoken. You know, it's all just happening on the ground. And that's such an exciting thing to discover. It, it's a different thing from being in solitude, but I don't feel that need in the same way as I did at that period of time in New York. Thank you. I think we've probably got time for two, two more questions. Um, We'll go, or perhaps three, we'll see how they go. We'll go at the back and then come here, and then if there's time, we'll go there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Robert, and thank you, Julie. Uh, it's really a question to both of you and um, a sort of comment that I sort of interpret both of your works as a beacon for to highlight our disconnect with nature and the power of art and literature and poetry to be able to reconnect I wondered whether you had any sort of comments or goals for the future generations that will come after us. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> uh, well, that, th thank you. I, I think a lot, perhaps we all think a lot at the moment about legacy that extends beyond um, the immediate generation. And uh, Julie and I both share an interest in deep, deeper times than, than, than human times and, and what, how they might carry an ethical charge as well as a, a conceptual aesthetic thrill that is something like the sublime in temporal terms. But, but I, I think now more than ever, it, they are those, an encounter with those timescales is, is more ethical than ever or, sh or should be. So, so I, I, I do think about this a lot. And I think also, as, I th as we all uh, perhaps must now, about what stories and images and cu cultural work can and can't do at this moment of crisis. And sometimes it does feel absolutely helpless, as um, I think it's David Gessner writes in his book, Sick of Nature, what, what can a lyric poem do against the massed telemarketers of a multinational corporation and um, systemic power is huge and we're all beneficiaries of it here. But I do think um, what Anna Greer, uh, radical lawyer, calls the radical restoring that we must undertake now does, does need to happen and that that's what will shift ontology, that's what will shift our ways of, of, of being and, 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 and nothing else will and that's what will bring about the change that we need. So I. Uh, a bit like the fire stacks, I sometimes I, I, my hope is extinguished, and other times it blazes uh, pretty pretty hard when the gale's blowing strongest. I, I think also, Polly, that um, sometimes art can move us and in different forms, and you know, writing that's that's different to the more political view of that. And for us to act, we need to be deeply moved. We need to be emotionally engaged, and certainly I've experienced in in the last ten years the the thing that makes me want to be at my most conscientious or my most driven or my most generous is actually other works of art and and writing um, because I feel so profoundly moved by it. I don't feel um, you know, as Rob said, so much of the sort of news and the political news is so, so disheartening. You, you actually feel drained by it rather than motivated and galvanized. And what I found in listening to artists and even some of the opening um, events happening here when George Monbiot was talking and Chris Watson was giving us sound recording, that's so powerful and so... It makes you want to get up and think, right, what can I do right now, right this minute? What, how can I change? And how can I, you know, um, inspire my family to change and, and my neighbours and so on? You know, and then, then it's exciting. And I think it can have a slightly longer lasting at times. Um, you know, some things, if we experience them at a very profound level, they... They arrive at a time that really works for us, just in that moment in time, that your sensibility and you, you meet a work of art in whatever form it is. And there's, there's an incredible synergy that happens where you feel you're growing, and the, and the art is the art, but it, it's sort of allowing you to take a whole nother step. And that's, um, that's a very powerful thing. I think an awful lot of change is made um, on that basis of, of deep inspiration. Thank you. Um, so there's a question. Thank here. you very much. Uh, this is inspired by your fisherman's tales. Uh, your art is clearly embedded in the heart of wilderness, but it's also within a geography where there's human communities beyond it in Lewis, yeah. Harris, in Jura. Yeah. How do they <coughs> respond? Do you have a sense of the sort of impact you're making on those communities? Um, well, <coughs> I love being in these communities, um, and this goes for... Japan and Namibia as well. Um, I've been so privileged to work with really exceptional people um, or work alongside exceptional people. Um, I, when, I, when I was in Jura, I gave in my middle year of being there, I gave an exhibition in, in the cooperage in the distillery, of Jura distillery, whiskey distillery. And I thought, um, because I painted on canvas, I sort of thought, oh, well, the villagers will like the paintings but they're going to think my film's really strange. So I was showing the, the first 
fast art films on, a, on an actual Super 8 projector in the village hall. And one of the, one of the guys said, oh, I, I really don't know about her paintings, but she, but she can build with stone. <laughs> and they love that work. And they really, you know, I mean, the, and the paintings were the landscape and they were physical. And, and then I'd also painted some of the local people. And they just, yeah, you know, that was whatever. But they really, really loved the, and I think it was because they're connecting with the, um, you know, they know how to work with stone. They, they work the, uh, the land. Um, one of the things I love about working in these parts, um, whether it's in the Hebrides or in the northwest of Namibia, where I was working with the Himba, is those people really live the landscape. And I think their connection with the landscape is so profound. And we are losing that very rapidly. And I think I seek to, in a sense, their influence and their knowledge, not necessarily literally. But um, I came back recently from um, Japan. I was working in a stone quarry in a region area, in Ishikawa region, um, a bit south of Kanazawa. And I was relaying it to Rob. It was really wonderful, because I was, I was creating quite a big scale work in a stone quarry. And when I was proposing the work to the quarry owner, um, one of the farmers, local farmers, who was the sort of um, cust like the village chief, came up, and we didn't have any shared language. And he said, "You know, um, please come build in our village. Don't build a sculpture in the quarry." And I explained why I wanted to work in, you know, in relation to the the actual cut quarry. And I showed him my idea, which was to build a series of um, steps running through all the rubble of the quarry right up to the big cut wall. And he just burst out laughing. And then 10 days later, um, the quarry owner gave me permission. And I was really grafting. And I was sort of walking these great big broken sloughs I was finding in all the spoil and gradually forming this, this um, series of steps. And he came back 10 days later, having finished with the rice, um, the rice harvest. And he was really quiet. And he walked up and down the, the existing steps. And then he went away, sort of nodded, and he went away, and he got his truck, and he got his tools and his helmet on, and he then helped me for the rest of that period. And he is now, um, it was so exciting. And then we gradually found a way to communicate better, because I don't have Japanese, and he doesn't have English. We had so much fun, and his laughter, he had never laughed at me, but he was really laughing with the the preposterousness of the idea, and then he joined in. It was so great. <laughs> that, that feels like a wonderful place to end. I'm sorry not to come to the last question. So one thing to say is that um, the, the show is the next floor up, uh, z minus one. You can't get the lift up to it. You just need to cross the lobby and go up the stairs if you'd like to see uh, the work there. There may be a rumor of some wine possibly available there as well, just mentioning that. Um, and, and really, otherwise, thank you for coming out, filling the room as you have tonight, being as attentive and generous in your spirits as you have. And wh what a wonderful evening. Thank yeah. you, uh, Julie Brooke. Thank you. Remind us on a couple of questions as well. Oh, yeah, sorry. Go, uh, sorry, go, go if you have to. Julie just wants to say a couple of thanks as well, but of course. Um, well, I would really like to thank hugely um, my partner, Chris, who's not actually here tonight. He's flying to India, very unusually. Um, it's usually me off on travels. And um, he has uh, lived um, on and off my time in Jura, um, in the Arch, and um, Mingale, and also my four children, who are really patient um, and great fun. And it's so wonderful that Winnie's here this evening, and my eldest daughter, because of the fact that we now film together, it's it's it, uh, amazing. Um, and also, my mum and dad are here, and I wanted to say thanks so much for coming because they've also been such a big support. But Rob, my last thanks is to you. It's it's so wonderful. Thank you so much for coming, and it's so exciting to speak with you, Rob, um, and and with everyone here. Um, Thank you so much. You're so generous. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.